two, one, two. Can you? Okay, you can hear, Coach. All right. How about? Hang on. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. How about this? One, one, two, three, four. Maybe I'll just talk on this one for the first. Is that okay? Okay, there we go. Uh, mic check one, two, three. Uh, media behind the curtain in the workroom. Uh, we should be beginning our interview session with NC State in about three minutes. If you want to wrap up and come over, if you're covering the Wolfpack, we will start roughly three minutes. You got this out? Say what? Take it out. Okay, uh, as we await the arrival of Coach Keats, who we have some housekeeping notes to make. First of all, we want to welcome everyone to Dallas, North Texas, and the American Airlines Center for the NCAA Men's South Regional. Um, as a courtesy to everyone in the room, our coaches, our student athletes, please silence your cell phone, and I'll remember to do the same. Um, Please signal that you wish to ask a question on the microphone to either Sarah. We're supposed to have Edith in here, but I don't see Edith yet, but with Sarah has the mic. So just uh, flag her or flag me, and we will try to get the microphone over to you. Uh, please, as always, if you've been through these tournaments a million times, please provide your name and media affiliation each time you ask a question during the press conference. <clears throat> um, recording press conferences on cell phones or cameras that's prohibited. Please access the uh, NCAA Digital Media Hub to obtain the video and audio content. All right? And that's throughout the tournament. Uh, locker rooms are open during this interview session if you need uh, to access additional student athletes besides the ones that will appear on the stage today. And if you are joining us on Zoom, then please use the raised hand function for questions. We will address questions here in the interview room first, and if time permits, then we will take questions from Zoom, okay? So don't forget that. I'll, I'll be checking on you uh, during the duration of the news conference, but be sure to do the uh, raise hand feature. And this interview session should last approximately 15 minutes or less. We are ready. We are now joined by Coach Keats from NC State. He'll be on stage in just a second. Right there, right in front of me. Good to see you. I'm Charlie. Hey, Charlie. Okay, we are now joined by uh, the head coach of the Wolfpack of NC State, Coach Keats. Would you like to make an opening statement or go straight to questions? Uh, let's go straight to questions, if you don't mind. I'm good with that. Coach, first question is on your right here on the aisle. Okay. Uh, coach, Dan Walken, USA Today. Why weren't you guys better this year? <laughs> you know, uh, I think we had our moments. And if you look at our team in different segments, you would say, man, they were good. You know, we remember we started off the ACC um, season five and one. And then I think we had a couple of rough spots. And, you know, it's weird. We, we, we brought in eight different guys. And I think it took a little longer than I thought. We, like we played well early. And then in between, I thought we were just OK. And then we kind of find our, found our stride once we got into March a little bit. So it's weird. Um, it's a good question. But like I said, we, we had some moments. And, and then we kind of turned it around. But when you look at you know, our 20-game schedule, every game that we lost, probably outside of one or two, we were in it. And what we had to do is we had to clean up some of the things we didn't do well. And obviously, we got better. Yes, go ahead. What What is it? Do you think that in, in the current transfer environment that we might see more teams like yours that don't really 
get it all together until you know the last possible minute? Absolutely. I mean, you think about it. it and, and here's here's a difference in my team last year and this year. We had a bunch of transfers the previous year, but we had an opportunity to play a foreign game, which gave us ten practices. And when you get those 10 practices, they mean a lot in the summertime. And then to go over and play against some national teams and everything else, I think that really helped that team. Uh, but when you just start, you know, when basketball starts and you got a bunch of new dudes, it, it takes a long time. And especially when it's from your guards. You know, if you got returning guards, I think it makes a lot of difference. But in our situation, we lost to Quavion Smith and Jaquel Joyner, who both – you know, that was 34 points a game for us. And so it took us a while to get to where we are. Coach, next question will be on your right by the uh, black curtain. The Richmond Times Dispatch. Kevin, you've got a center who looks like a left tackle, a point guard who is a lacrosse All American, a forward who's fasting for Ramadan. Is this as unique a team as you've ever had, and how did it come together? See, B DJ Burns would think he's a tight end. You can't say left tackle. That's not right. You know, um, it, it makes for a great story, and it does. I mean, we, you know, when you look at, you know, teams that are in the Sweet 16, you always try to figure out how did they get here. Well, we won, we got here because we're very unique. I want you to think about this. Um, we've got a traditional old school back to the basket post guy who can score. Most teams don't have that. Uh, we're starting a, a point guard who is a legitimate point guard. Most teams have, you know, kind of a combo guard as we've had in the past. And then we've got a lot of good pieces around it. And, you know, we've got a 6-1 combo guard in DJ Horn who could really scare the, score the basketball. And so I think one of the things that's helped us out is because we're different, it's actually helped us. Like, how, how often are you going to play against a, a post guy that's a lefty with a great touch that can really pass out the double team? And Michael O'Connor has become, you know, a, a scorer. You look at him in the early games, you're like, man, he's just a passer, 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 and his numbers don't support it. Um, you know, give our assistant coaches a lot of credit. I think the development of some of these guys late in the year has really helped us become a, a good team and, and has gotten, gotten us to this point so far. Okay, here in the middle, left side. Hey, Coach uh, Scott Gradsky, CBS Milwaukee. You mentioned the importance of experience at guards with Marquette. They have two who have been together for three years, and Cam Jones and Tyler Kolek. What kind of a challenge do they present? Man, those guys are really good. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out which one's better. And I know that's not fair to them, but they, they complement each other in, in different ways. And, you know, both uh, get to the left hand is really good and talented and that's a, that's a major challenge for us because in order for us to have success, we've got to do a good job of controlling those guys. And um, they, play, they play extremely well. They play extremely well together. Um, they're older. They understand they have played together. And that's something that you can't substitute. And so top of our scouting report is those two guys. But when I say that, Marquette is so much more than just the, the guard play. They've got good play all over the floor. Okay, on the front row, left side. Kyle Boone, CBS Sports. Um, you guys lost seven of your last nine regular season games. I think it's fair to say probably on the hot seat entering kind of the postseason. You guys go on a crazy run, five wins, five days of the ACC tournament. What changed for you guys? You know, what changed? It's weird. And, and, and like I told you, it's so many great storylines. Seven, what did you say, seven of our last eight? Seven of our last nine, and now we won seven of seven. And the crazy thing about it is every game that we have won uh, of our seven was an elimination game. If we lose any of those games in the ACC, we don't go to the NCAA tournament. And then your two teams that get to the Sweet 16, you lose them, you go home. What changed? Uh, we got smarter. Uh, we got the same players who are playing with a little bit more confidence. But when we went back, and I start with the ACC, and we went back and we looked at every team that we lost to, it didn't have a lot to do with them. It was more about what we didn't do, uh, understanding scouting reports. Um, we had segments in each game where I thought if we played well enough, we would have won the game, but breakdowns and everything else. And so what we talked about going into the ACC tournament and this tournament is let's limit our mistakes and let's stay locked in. And a lot of them was, you know, transition defense, ball screen coverage, 
things that you could clean up, you know, and things that, you know, you don't want to have major league problems where you just can't play. We didn't have that problem because we were good enough to win games. We had problems that you could solve. And honestly, to their credit, um, we grew up in scouting reports and our fin work became better and they understood what we needed to do not to beat ourselves. Okay, again. Boo Corgan asked at the, after the ACC tournament uh, kind of what he saw in this team, following this team. He, he described it as unwavering. How would you describe this team as, and, and they, they're resolved on the stretch of the season? You know, I haven't had time to really, you know, reflect on what we've done. And because I'm so much in the moment of it. But I was sitting in the bed late last night after watching film. And I was like, man, we just, you know, we won five games in five days against five national champions. And, you know, it, it was weird because we got stronger and better in each second half. And we looked like, you know, one of the fresher teams, we looked like we'd had two or three days rest. Uh, I just, this team just believes um, the energy is high. Uh, we having fun. We talked about, you know, going to both tournaments, the ACC and this tournament, and having a lot of fun. And we've been able to stay in the moment. And what I mean by that is we never look past the next opponent. And if we're fortunate enough to move on, we are. Um, but, you know, we talked about, you know, being together, trusting. You know, our, our culture is what we call art, A-R-T-T, -T, uh, accountability, relentless, toughness, and doing it together. And any time that, you know, in this stretch where we didn't feel like that we were providing our culture, um, we've talked about that. We've leaned on it. We've leaned in on it. And we've done a good job with it. So I, all of the heavy lifting has to go to those guys because they, they've helped make, made the switch. And, you know, we just pull the right strings. Yep. Hey, let's move on uh, the right side of coach here toward the front. Back to the topic of transfers, uh, a year ago at this time, you guys were home. You obviously made a lot of transfer moves. How do you feel with the portal being open at this time of year while you're focusing on the game and also trying to deal with that, knowing you have a lot of roster turnover coming? I don't like it now. Uh, and I can't even say how I liked it last year because of the fact that we probably were recruiting. But I will say this. Um, I, I do know that the portal has to open at some point. Um, if I was a new coach, taking a job somewhere else, I would love for the portal to be open right now. If I was at home, I would like for it to be open. I'm in the Sweet 16, so I hate that it's open. Um, that being said, I think we have to get small windows. Um, maybe keep it open two or three days out of the week, and you know, certain days may be closed. But I, I do think it's a little unfair for teams who have worked their butt off to get to a certain point. And they, you know, for me, example, I got no choice. I love the recruiting part of it, but I've got to concentrate on Marquette. But any other time, I've got to get on the phone and try to figure out who can we replace, you know, DJ Horn, DJ Burns, Casey Morsell, and I'm doing it right now. And so I don't like it at this moment. I don't want to sound like a hypocrite, but right now I don't like it. So I wish there is a, a way we can look at it and try to figure out is there another option for that. A reminder to media on Zoom, if you have a question, please use the uh, raise hand feature. Let's go in the back for our next question on the aisle. Hi, Kevin. Adam Teicher from ESPN. What tells you that the team from the last couple of weeks, the one that's won seven in a row, is really who you are and not the team that lost seven of nine ahead of that? Well, I don't think you can do it. I don't think you can do win seven games in a row in college basketball if that's not your identity. And I think that's what tells us who we are. You know, I go back to it, think about this now. You go into every game knowing that if you lose, that you're packing up and your season's over. You know, it's going to, it's probably going to be a long time since someone, you know, uh, goes in on a Tuesday in the ACC tournament and wins a championship on Saturday. Um, I hope it is because it's a fun experience and hopefully someone else will, will be able to do that. The other part of it is, you know, going into the tournament, we were 11, we were a 10 seed in the ACC. NCAA, we're 11 seed. And if you watch us, we don't play like that. Um, our guys believe we don't look at numbers. Uh, we just believe that, you know, uh, we earned the right to be here. A lot of teams because of um, maybe the net and also they're good teams. They're here, but we had to do it the old fashioned way. We had to earn it. 
we had to go through our tournament, and it's almost like you know my days at UNCW. In order for me to go to the tournament, I had to win the the CAA tournament, and we did it. And that was three days in a row. So I go back and look at it. Like to to your to your question is, you just don't accidentally get hot and and win games seven games in a row with the type of teams that you played. I think we've had in that stretch maybe three or four top 25 teams, maybe even top 10, and we responded well. We will stay in the back on the right. Hey, Coach, this is Lane Higgins from the Wall Street Journal. I've got two for you. The first one's quick, uh, but what shoes did you bring to Dallas, and are you <laughs> mixing it up? No, not mixing it up. I got the same shoes that I wore, and um, I got some shiny, some really shiny shoes. It's an honor to referees, so they – they know to give me good calls because we both got shiny shoes on. And um, to the Wall Street Journal, uh, that's pretty good. I saw a, someone send me a, a, um, a picture or a screenshot of DJ Burns on the cover of it, or if it was a cover of the sport, I don't know what it was, but I shout out to you guys for that. Yeah, we wrote about DJ uh, not too long ago, but kind of in that vein that um, – one thing I'm curious about is NC State is a proud program with a history of kind of going on these magical runs in the tournament before. And obviously, the 1983 team probably stands out as being one of those teams that's just iconic in March Madness history. So is that something where you've been sort of educating this current team on the history of that? And have any of the players from that year reached out and tried to talk to the guys? No, our, our, our players from 74 and 83 – uh, they have been on campus through my tenure, in, including this year. And, look, I can't say enough about them and what they pour into our players. You know, they've been in practices. We've honored them, which we should. We should continue to do that. But anytime those guys are around, David Thompson, Monty Tao, um, you, know, you know, everybody who's come through, they've done a good job. Even I, I get text messages from, you know, Sidney Lowe, Thurl Bailey, um, of course, Derek Wittenberg works there. I mean, it's just, I mean, they're so excited about uh, what's happening and they're always sharing their experience about 83 and, um, you know, how great it was and, you know, the magical run. And I think our guys listen to that. I mean, they do. Uh, we try to focus on, you know, being who we are now. It's a little bit different than when they went through, but it's certainly paying off for us. Almost out of time for Coach. Any other questions? I don't think I see it. Okay, last question in the back. Hi, uh, Gary Hahn with the Wolfpack Sports Network. You told me uh, recently that the offensive improvement over the last seven games has to do with caring and sharing. Can you break that down? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, when we – guys like Michael O'Connor has really helped our team you know, as a pure point guard, because what it's completely done is it's allowed everybody else to be themselves. You know, DJ Horn, we need him to score the basketball. Casey Morsell, we need him to score the basketball. DJ um, Burns and, and Mo, And, you know, when we get Michael in there who is, you know, starting to look for his offense a little bit more, but more of a pass-first guy, I think that's really helped. DJ Burns has helped. Um, his ability to pass out of double teams I mean, the guy may see more double teams than anybody I remember in recent history, and and people are doing it different ways. They're trapping post to post, from guard to guard, I mean, guard to big, and uh, he's finding people. So we have shared the basketball, and we have taken – we went from taking good shots to great shots because of our ability to share the basketball. And I think that's, uh, that's really helped our team. And, you know, when you get into any type of postseason, um, bad shots crush you. And in our situation, we haven't done that. You know, these guys are completely played together, and they really have shared the basketball. So sharing is caring, and caring is sharing too. All right, Coach, thank you so much. And, Thanks, guys. Uh, good luck tomorrow. We'll, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank 24 you, 24 hours maybe. Is it 24 hours? Something like that. All right. See you. <laughs> thank you. Y'all be good. Thanks a lot. Okay, the student athletes from uh, North Carolina State will be here in just a bit. They have left their locker room and are heading toward our stage.
NC State has arrived, the three student athletes. They'll be here in just a second. Okay, we are now joined by our three student athletes from uh, NC State, uh, DJ Horn, Casey Morsell, and DJ Burns. Questions for our three guys, please raise your hand. We'll bring the mic over and this session will last for approximately 15 minutes. First question. Guys, I think we will have one on your left on the front row will be our first question. Kyle Boone with CBS Sports. Uh, you guys lost seven of your last nine regular season games. Go and win five games, five games in five days at the ACC tournament. Now you guys are in the Sweet 16. Uh, what changed? What uh, what helped you guys turn things around here? I'd say our defensive mentality. I think that we've been playing um, way more together. Um, teams aren't able to just drive our gaps like they were, and they aren't just able to straight line drive us like they were. I think that we've tightened up in that aspect for sure. Um, yeah, I agree with DJ. Um, I think another big key for us is that we're not beating ourselves. Um, you know, we're uh, you know we're not our own worst enemy. Uh, we're we're clicking, but um, you know the defense is, you know, one of our biggest priorities. But uh, you know we're we're kind of holding teams to one shot, one and done, and um, just doing different things so that uh, it, it makes it tough for the opponent. Yeah, I agree with both of them. Uh, you know, we're not beating ourselves, and uh, the defensive level intensity has increased. Um, and I think that just plays into, uh, you know, the focus level and um, just the connectedness all together um, for our team and our program has just increased. And that's what uh, translates to these wins. And on the right side up front. For all three of you, you all three transferred in at different times. What was the experience when you first got to NC State? And then as a transfer, how did that impact how you would welcome in the rest of you guys as you came in? Let's start with DJ Horn and then move down the table. Um, you know, I was, you know, being from Raleigh, I was a little familiar with NC State, but, you know, never in the program. But so coming here, I had knew some of the guys in the program. Um, so it felt a little bit better coming in from day one. But, um now that I'm here, um, I would say it feels a lot different, especially with all the recent success we we found and everything. So I would say it's, it's been great. Casey? Uh, <laughs> um, I would say uh, coming in um, to state, this is my third year here. Um, and, uh, you know, when I first got to state, um, our season was um, very unsuccessful. Um, you know, we only had four wins in the conference. And, um, you know, I feel like after that season, we've just gotten better and better. Last year, having a tournament appearance, finishing sixth in the league, and then this year, um, advancing this far. So, um, the fact that we've gotten better and better um, since I've been there, or since I've been in, in Raleigh, um, it's just been a it's been a great journey. It's been a roller coaster in terms of emotions, a lots of up and ups and downs. Um, but Raleigh is uh, in a great position. Um, now that this is my last run. DJ? I'd say um, my experience when I first got here was a little different. Um, I was playing behind Dusan and, you know, I was, it was my opportunity to be patient. Um, when I first came here, I, I asked God to, you know, give me the opportunity to learn patience and he put me right into it immediately when I came here. And um, I think that it's, it's paid off now, but it was definitely a different experience from these guys coming in. Reminder to media on Zoom, if you have a question, please utilize the uh, raise hand feature. Next question here on your left, toward the middle. Uh, Scott Gradsky, CBS Milwaukee, uh, for DJ Burns. You guys have been outscoring opponents, I think, by 34 uh, in the, the tournament so far, down in the paint. What kind of challenges do uh, Oso Iguodaro and, and David Joplin uh, present for you? Uh, they're two guys who have the ability to shoot as well. Well. Um, I forget. I don't forget how to pronounce his name, so I'm not gonna try to do that and you know say something crazy. But 
they um they both they both bring a presence being you know as tall as they are and as long as they are you know they're really good at um doing the things that they do you know like rolling and dunking the ball you know the the floaters in the middle you know they got a lot of good players and they got a lot of good pieces together but they're bigs you know they kind of bring them together okay now here on the aisle uh, Lily Zell, Fox 6 Milwaukee. Kind of going out that question for any of you guys. Um, when you're looking at film of Marquette and, and watching games, just what kind of challenges do they present? Casey, you want to take that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say they uh, they test your defensive awareness. Um, they, they do so many actions. Uh, one of the different things they do is, you know, uh, they use the, the five man as a ball handler. Um, they set screens. They they cut. And, um, you know, they, they do different things on the perimeter with the five man. So, um, I feel like everyone's going to be a, at some point ha is going to guard the perimeter, um, and you know we're, we're going to be a lot of different um, actions and, and rotations that we we kind of got to be aware for um, that they do. Okay, toward the back. Hey there, um, Lane Higgins from the Wall Street Journal. And this is for all of y'all. Um, I'm curious if any of you have any superstitions like your coach with the shoes that he's been wearing every game. Um, is there anything that you guys have been sticking to the last few games as you've been on this hot streak? DJ Burns, why don't you start? We'll come back to DJ on this end. Uh, pretty simple for me. I just use the same playlist. I've added songs to it, but I've had the same playlist since high school that I listen to specifically before games. Um, I would say just before the games, I like to pray, so I keep that very consistent. I think we skipped Casey. You want to respond? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm. I do both. I, I got the same playlist, and I pray before every game. So that's pretty much what's been my routine. Any other questions for uh, the three guys? We do toward the back, on the right side. Skyler Dixon with the AP. DJ Burns, the, the tournament every year seems to create kind of fan favorites through personalities, and you've kind of exuded that on camera just looking from afar. Do you sense that at all, and do you, you feel like you are becoming a bit of a fan favorite? And kind of related to that, has any NIL opportunities come out of what you all have done so far in the tournament? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm not going to speak on the NIL thing just because um, there's still some things that need to be you know finalized before we speak out on it. Um, but as far as the whole fan favorite thing, yeah, I've definitely noticed it. Um, it's been kind of crazy, you know, going from having almost zero media attention to a camera following you around all day has kind of been it's, – it's been cool, but, you know, I definitely noticed it. <laughs> Hard to miss it. Okay, here on the right. Yeah, Dan Walken from USA Today. Um, I, I'd like all three to comment on this, but – when you're at the ACC tournament on Tuesday, you know, you haven't had the season you wanted to have. I mean, does it really enter your mind that you could go on a run like this or are you just kind of looking at, you know, one one game trying to trying to stay alive? How how does that how do you mentally process that when you're, you know, down to that literal last chance to do something? Let's start with DJ Horn and then go down the table. Um, yeah, I, I just feel like we came into that tournament with a uh, new life. We knew that it was a, a new season basically for us to go in there and uh, make something happen. And uh, just looking back over our whole season, we knew that we were a good team and uh, a lot of the teams that we had uh, in our path to get to where we wanted to get to, um, you know, we, we battled with a lot of those teams. So we knew that we could compete and, and win those games. Yeah, uh, that's pretty much what it was. Um, we we went into this postseason uh, with the approach that it's a it's a new season. Um, even in our even in our, in our meeting um, before we went to DC, um, you know, Keats wrote on the board zero and zero. He was like, every team is zero and zero, and um, that was the the mindset and the approach that we went down to DC with. And you know, every game was its own championship. Literally, uh, we didn't really look ahead. We never. Um, you know, look past anyone, even three, four games in, we was until it's done, like, you know, then we'll we'll sit there and enjoy it. And that's the same approach we've had in this tournament. And DJ. Uh I say yeah, I thought we could do it the whole time. I mean, if you look back at the teams that we played to get to that point, you know, um Louisville we played them and took Syracuse to some close games. Um we had already beaten and went to overtime with Virginia, you know, Close games for the most part against Duke. Um, 
So we knew we could do it. It was just a matter of, you know, doing the things that were necessary to get the job done. And then um, I think that we just kind of taken that momentum and kept it rolling. Any other questions? Okay, we're approaching the end of this uh, session. We'll go on the right toward the back. Casey, following up on that, how do you think that mentality that you've had to carry since then helps now that the stakes are quite a bit bigger? Uh, I mean, yeah, I would say uh, just don't change. I feel like we've uh, been in so many positions. We've been tested so many times throughout this run um, that, you know, it, it's it's been easy for, for guys to kind of fold and, you know, go or fall into the pressure um, and it hasn't happened and you know we just whatever teams or whatever happens or even on the outside we just got to kind of keep that same connection for the rest of this tournament. Okay the last question will go in the back in front of the TV camera. Gary Hahn with the Wolfpack Sports Network. Can you guys can each of you break down the uh, incredible chemistry that's developed on this team over the last seven games? You said all three? And, and explain it. Yes, yes, sir. Okay, uh, DJ Burns will let you lead off. Uh, I don't know. I think it's I think it's always been there. I don't think that we, we treat each other differently now. Um, everyone else is just paying attention because we're winning, you know. Um, that's what winning does, though. It's always going to seem like you're a little bit closer together when you're winning. And don't get me wrong, you know, we, we're still building great memories, but – I don't think that too many of us, like, I think we mixed well from the time we got together. I think by November, we had a pretty good chemistry going. Casey? Yeah, I agree with DJ. Um, you know, we've been very close um, throughout it all, throughout the good times and the bad. And, um, you know, just because, you know, the results don't show up on the court um, doesn't mean we, we weren't close. It was um, just, you know, just trying to figure everything out. Uh, there was a lot of new faces, a lot of new people trying to adjust to the you know, to the program, to the culture, and it took it, it took time. Um, and you know, the fact that we're finally starting to click um, is is great, and it's great timing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and DJ. Yeah, I disagree with them. Uh, you know, coming in, I felt like from day one, you know, the vibes were always there on and off the court. Um, and like DJ was saying, you know, you win like how we've been winning anywhere. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna bring anybody closer together. So uh, I think the main thing that we'll take from this is just uh, learning how learning how to win and learning how hard it is to win as a team. Uh, so that you know, after it's all said and done with us, you know, we can kind of set the foundation and hopefully keep that here at NC State. Okay, guys, thanks for spending time with us. Um, appreciate you being here. We will see you tomorrow after the game. Okay, thank you so much. You thank guys. you. Good morning, good afternoon, hey, hey.
Uh, media in the workroom, our next interview session begins at 1.10, and that will be with the Marquette student-athletes, okay? So 1.10, so we have a bit of a break.
Okay. <clears throat> Did you get that? <clears throat> Media in the uh, workroom, uh, we're about five minutes away, give or take, for the start of our Marquette News Conference with the student athletes first. So if you cover the uh, Golden Eagles, they will be here shortly. Hey, uh, don't forget we have a Zoom this time. Hey, Wendell. How are we doing, man? Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Also, a reminder to everyone that the locker room will be open during this half-hour session that Coach and the student-athletes are here. So if you need access to any other Marquette uh, student athletes, locker room will be open. Remember that recording uh, press conferences on cell phones on, or cameras is prohibited. Please access the NCAA Digital Media Hub if you need video or audio content, okay? If you are joining us on Zoom, uh, then please use the raise hand feature uh, to signal that you do have a question. And uh, we will address questions here in the interview room first. And if time permits, we will go to Zoom. So again, we will have someone monitoring uh, uh, the Zoom call to look for your hand. Probably about two minutes away. Another reminder, we have um, floating microphones in the room, so uh, please signal that you have a question. We have Sarah on one side, Edith on the other, and please state name and affiliation when you ask that question. Uh, student athletes from Marquette have arrived. We'll be on stage in just a second. Okay, we are ready to begin our um, interview session, 15 minutes in length. 
with uh, Marquette, the three student athletes, as you can tell from the stage cards, uh, Cam Jones, Tyler Kolick, and Oso Igadaro. Questions for any of our three students? And the microphone on the first one will go on the right here on the aisle. Uh, ben Steele, Milwaukee Journal Center. Cam, this is for you. Uh, Shaka, you know, he has that next play philosophy that he preaches. You guys have dealt with so many nagging injuries this year. How have you seen that, that next play philosophy play out for, for yourself and for the teammates as well this season? Um, well, what up, Ben, first of all? Uh, it kind of just, you know, take the excuses out of it. Um, you know, it takes what it takes, uh, hurt or not. You know, if you hurt and you're playing, you, we still need you to do your job, um, you know, to the, to the furthest extent that you can. And, um, you know, we all out here trying to win. So it's a common goal. So if you got nagging injuries and you're going to play through it, you know, we need you to play through it. Uh, yeah, we all out here trying to do one thing, for sure. Okay, up front here on the left. Wendell Barnhouse from Learfield Sports Communications. I uh, want to ask a question for Oso and then follow up with one for Tyler. Can you explain how Coach Smart has kind of utilized you as sort of a secondary ball handler uh, distributor, your second on the team in assists? And sort of for you personally, how does that work out on the floor? Uh, yeah, Coach lets me handle the ball a lot, um, create action for other guys. We have a lot of good scorers on this team. So when I can facilitate and get them shots, uh, it's good for our team. So coach gives me the freedom to do that. Tyler, what does it do for the team to have, I mean, obviously you're leading the nation in assists, but to have another guy like him to be kind of a secondary distributor? Yeah, it just gives teams a different look. Uh, so it's not, you know, me coming off the ball screen or Cam coming off the ball screen every time. You know, Oso can come off the ball screens or he can break off his guy and make a play for other people. So, you know, it allows me to, to get off the ball and maybe get some catch and shoot opportunities. Other questions? Okay. Again on the aisle. Along the same lines, Oso and Tyler, both, if you both can speak to this, just your pick and roll chemistry has always been really strong. I just, I'm curious how you guys view, was it always there from the start? How did you guys develop that? Just your perspective on, on how that came to be so good. Oh, so you want to start? Uh, we just played a lot together. It wasn't always like that. I remember the first summer when Tyler got there, we played pick up. I couldn't catch any of his passes, and it took me a little bit. But we played, so we played three years together now, a ton of games, a lot of big moments, and the trust is there. Um, just to feel for each other and where he's going to put the ball. So he's a great passer. He makes my job a lot easier. I think uh, really trusting each other and having those conversations about what we like, uh, what we don't like. Uh, you know, in, the, in the last game, it was like it was a side ball screen, and he, he, he wanted to catch. And I kind of just waited while to come set the screen. We went back on the other end. He's telling me to trust him, trust him. And, you know, so we can have those, those hard conversations no matter what's going on, either in the heat of the moment or in practice when we're trying to fix something. So I think, you know, the, the ball screen connection really just goes to, to our connection off the floor, too. Next question will come in the back on the right side. David Teal with the Richmond Times Dispatch. Tyler, watching Shaka on the sideline, especially when you guys are on defense down in his crouch like he's guarding somebody. Is that the way he is in practice? <laughs> I wouldn't say in practice because he's not trying to guard us. I and mean, maybe he's trying to guard the other team as a sixth defender out there. Um, but there was actually a clip earlier this year where, where he was sliding on the baseline. A lot of people had things to say about it. But now he's just he's giving us energy. You know, he, he's in a stance. He's probably the lowest one on the floor. So, you know, looking over at him, it makes us want to get in the stance. Next question will come on the left. In the middle. Skyler Dixon with the AP. Tyler, how aware are you all of uh, Shaka's former life as a coach of the Longhorns, and how much would you like to win for him while he's here in Texas? Yeah, uh, we actually played Texas earlier this year um, and, and obviously knew how much that game meant. But, you know, we're not, we're not really looking at, at, the, at the past. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to go forward with this team and, you know, He's trying to build a, a new legacy over here at Marquette. And, you know, we're at, us as players are trying to do that for him and, and help him continue with that. Debbie, I think we may have a uh, caller on Zoom. 
Yes, we have a call from Parth. Parth, if you would unmute yourself, identify yourself, and state your question, please. Yeah, Parth, the uh, Daily Memphian. Cam, I got a question for you. I spoke to Willie Jenkins this morning, uh, obviously your high school coach, and he kind of raved about your growth, you know, on and off the court and how proud he was of you um, for putting on for Memphis, man. What does that mean to you, you know, representing your city on this stage and at this level? Um, well, first off, shout out to Coach Willie. Um, appreciate what he's done for me in my career, how he's molded me as a man and a player. Um, I mean, it feels great, you know, especially not many – if any people outside of my family and close friends thought I would be anything in this sport. Um, so, you know, I definitely keep that chip on me wherever I go. And, you know, I take people like Coach Willie and my family with me and we, we ride that together. And I'm very appreciative for them. Okay, back here in the interview room here on the right aisle. Uh, Cam, with all these big performances you have in the postseason, you kind of earning more of a national reputation. Um, you know, people are talking about your NBA prospects and, and things like that. As, how do you deal with that, just blowing up fame-wise? Um, I mean, right now, I kind of don't even know what you're talking about, honestly. Um, haven't really been, you know, much in touch with anything outside of this team, anything outside of, you know, going into what we want to do. Uh, it's been a lot, a lot more peaceful that way, um, you know, not hearing from people I really don't want to hear from. Uh, so, yeah, that, I would say, I mean, I guess I'm appreciative for it, but I really honestly don't know what you're talking about. Other questions for any of the three guys? No hands? Okay, we have one here. Toward the back on your right. Uh, Gary Hahn with the Wolfpack Sports Network. I just wonder what uh, you've uh, seen of uh, NC State and the uh, the matchup in the in, in the middle with DJ Burns being uh, not only uh, a force inside but an elite passer. If you decide to double team him, who was that for again? Any of them? Uh, okay, uh, let's start with uh, Cam first. Uh, yeah, we definitely know. You know, NC State, you know, um, the type of team they are, the tough team they are, uh, a good team they are. Uh, we know what, like you said, what Burns brings. And, I mean, we're not going to change nothing that we do. Uh, we're going to go out there. We're going to be ourselves. Uh, He's going to see some traps, and we're going to adjust accordingly. Hey, Tyler. We were watching film today. He hit, he hit like, a spin fadeaway, kind of like a – Escalade from the N1 mixtapes. Uh, <laughs> now nah, he, he's good though. He's he's super skilled. Um, so just you know, trying to do everything we can to stop him. Also, yeah, he's a really good player, good passer, good scorer. Um, we've we've been playing really good players, really good bigs, guards, whatever all year, and we guard as five. So to answer your question, I mean, we're just gonna we're just gonna guard them as a team as five, and him as a player as five and just keep being us, like Cam said. Let's go back to Zoom now for another question. We have another question from Parth. Parth, go ahead and um, unmute and state your question. Cam, just got two quick follow-ups. Um, you know, you talked about kind of your, your growth since getting to Marquette, and obviously your development's been, um, you know, amazing, to kind of say the least. What's, what's it taken um, for you to get to this point, to, you know, get to the program and be a seven-point-per-game scorer and, uh, to now be one of the best guards in the country. Uh, how do you describe that journey? Um, I mean, it's been a lot of faith, a lot of prayer. You know, I got you know a lot of good people in my corner, you know, starting with Coach Smart. You know, I trust every word he says to me. And, uh, you know, he knows what he's talking about. Um, he knows me as a person. So I would just say, man, it's been a real blessing to see how a lot of this played out. And, uh, you know, very excited to, you know, see the future and how these great people like Oso and T and uh, and my teammates in my corner. Okay, the right side of the room. Uh, this is for Cam and Oso Kyle Boone, CBS Sports. Uh, Tyler missed six games with the oblique injury. Um, came back, hasn't missed a beat since uh, since that absence. 
obviously seen an impact what he can do in the box score. Um, for you guys, how do you describe his presence beyond the box score? You know he's going to put up the, the scoring, the assist. When he's on the floor, it feels like this team is a little different. Uh, yeah, for sure. Tyler carries himself with a great demeanor, a uh, serious demeanor, just wants to win. Uh, very, very fierce competitor. Uh, you know, he's, he's sharpened my competitive edge, uh, for sure, just being around him the last few years. Uh, he's definitely a great voice for us. When he was out, he was a great voice for us, talking to me, telling me what he sees on the bench, watching games, uh, you know, telling me to be aggressive, take over the game, whatnot, whatever the case may be. Uh, yeah, he's been a great voice for the freshmen. And you know, having having his belief and knowing that they're gonna have to, they was gonna have to step up. Um, he's been a great, a great voice for us. Uh, and the coach told him that you know, like we needed you just as much off the court when you've been out as we do, and want you on the court for sure. Also, yeah, I think he, <clears throat> he brings an edge when he's on the court, and I think the ball definitely moves a lot better. Um, not just his assist, but when he gets the ball, and it just it, it's a domino for the rest of the play. I think when he was out. We, me and Cam had the ball a lot, and it was a lot more one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of ISO. Um, and we won some games like that, but I don't know if that was sustainable. And we're definitely a, a much better team with him on the floor. OK, any other questions here in the room? Any questions on Zoom? No questions? OK, guys, we'll let you uh, go back to your locker room. Thank you for coming. You. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Good luck. Be careful. We don't want to hurt yourself up here. <laughs> we will start with um, Coach Shock here in just a few minutes. Okay, we are joined now by uh, Marquette head coach Shaka Smart. Coach, would you like to make an opening statement or go straight to questions? We're excited to be here in Dallas. Um, it's been a heck of a journey to this point. Our guys uh, are doing a great job being locked in on the moment. Uh, obviously, NC State presents a lot of challenges. They're playing terrific basketball. I've known Kevin Keats for a long, long time ton of respect for him. Um, so it'll be an exciting opportunity for us tomorrow evening. OK, thank you, Coach Smart. First question for you will be on the aisle here on your left. Shaka, Wendell Barnhouse from Learfield Communications. Um, 
Could you explain a little bit how you've used Igadaro as sort of a secondary guy? I guess I read a couple of years ago you reached out to the Nuggets to, I guess, see how they use Jokic or whatever. And also kind of a second part, having somebody like him, the second leading assist guy with the leading assist guy in the nation, what does that do for your offense? It does so much. He's a very unique player. He's unlike anyone I've ever coached. And I, I don't think – there's really anyone else in college basketball that has the, the skill set that he has. Uh, there's so many great big guys uh, around the country, so many guys that do different things. Obviously, DJ Burns is an example. But also, he's really like a point guard out there at 6'10", passes the ball extremely well. He enjoys passing. Um, you know, sometimes we've got to twist his arm to shoot a little bit more. What we try to do is get the ball in his hands and, and create a lot of actions off of that, including pick and rolls for him. Uh, he's a really unique guy in that on back-to-back -back possessions, he could set a pick and roll, run to the rim, and dunk a ball where he catches it at 12 feet. And then the next possession, he can handle the ball in a pick and roll, and he could come off and either score or create for his teammates, which is just – you don't see that a lot. Um, so he's been really, really good and uh, just grateful to have him, him and Tyler together – definitely set a tone of unselfishness and creating for others. Okay, here in the aisle in the middle. Uh, Shaka, Ben Steele, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Um, there were times when it might have seemed like the universe was conspiring against your team with all the nagging injuries and everything. Uh, you seem to have a very pragmatic deal with that as it comes approach, um, kind of like your next play philosophy. Just where does that disposition come from for you? Try to learn from the Stoics. We just control what we can control, you know. Uh, there are certain things that happen in basketball. It's very, very easy as a player or a coach to feel like, you know, how is this happening to us? How is this happening to me? But the reality is if you watch enough basketball, you're around it enough, things happen. Injuries happen. Uh, bad bounces happen. You know, banked in shots from well beyond the three happen. Um, and sometimes they happen in your favor, too. So uh, we've asked our guys to control what we can control. Certainly, it's my responsibility as a coach to set a good example in that way. We will stay on coaches, right? Hey, Coach, Adam Rossel with Spectrum News Texas. Obviously, Chase is back in his old stomping grounds. What has he meant to this team for the first part? And, and what do you remember about getting in touch with him when you were back at UT? We got two Texas guys on our team, Chase Ross and Cam Brown. Um, who are, they got a lot of pride in this state, um, which is, you know, something that uh, you, I always admire about people when they feel, you know, pride about where they're from. Chase has been terrific. Um, he, last year as a freshman, uh, did better than I think even he expected. Um, and this year as a sophomore, he's continued to improve, even though he's gone through a variety of different injuries. You know, he's, he separated his shoulder about halfway through the season. Uh, he's had ankle injuries, <clears throat> different bumps and bruises, but he is tough. He's, uh, as I describe him, um, as much as anybody on our team or more, he's a real dude. Um, he's the one guy on our team. If, uh, you know, I coached a guy at a VCU named Mo Ali Cox that plays for the Indianapolis Colts. If a football team was looking for a guy, Chase, Chase could be that too. Uh, but he, we love him on the basketball court. Um, when we first got in touch with him, Cody Hatt from our staff did a phenomenal job reaching out to him. The thing about this state, recruiting this state, there are so many great players. And there's usually about you know, a dozen or so that get the most attention uh, in any given high school class. But then there's another you know, maybe two dozen um, that have the chance to be terrific and a lot of times turn into as good or even better players. So Chase kind of fell into that second tier at the time, uh, which was part of why we were able to recruit him. And he's been an unbelievable program guy, and I think he's got a chance to be a terrific player. Coach is right in the middle. Kyle and CBS Sports. Uh, Coach, you talked a little bit about luck. Uh, being in your favor or sometimes playing against you. Uh, Colette gets injured at the at the end of the regular season, able to come back, but it did feel like, you know, kind of a, not this again. Um, 
you make it to the Sweet 16 now for the first time since 2011. Is there a sense of relief for you personally making it back to the Sweet 16? Not really. I mean, I've been asked that question a lot. Um, try not to really dwell too much on the past because, you know, then all of a sudden you do something really, really fun and exciting and your overwhelming emotions relief. So, you know, uh, to me, it's more gratitude, um, excitement, joy, appreciation for our guys, uh, for all the things that we've been through together. Um, and most importantly, we're sitting up here today, you know, playing tomorrow night with the chance to advance. So um, obviously that's where our focus is. In the back by the curtain. Shocker, David Teal with the Richmond Times Dispatch. Without Hi, what, David. What's up, man? Without dwelling on the past, you were on this stage in San Antonio in 2011. How have you evolved and changed, and what have you learned over that time? First of all, it's good to see you. Uh, and you're a very good writer, so appreciate you. Um, how have I changed? Gotten older, my hair's changed. Um, I think probably the biggest transformation for me uh, as a coach since 2011 is just understanding how much that I don't control. Uh, I think as a young coach, you try to assert control over so many different things. 2011 was a unique run for us just because in a lot of ways, we were playing with house money. You know, a lot of people didn't think we belonged in the NCAA tournament. And that group just had this, this incredible uh, motivation of something to prove. Um, you know, most of the times when you get in the NCAA tournament, there's more expectations on you. Um, certainly this year is that for us. Um, but, you know, trying to understand what helps the players be their best. And I think with that, learning that coaching your team is not the same as coaching your players. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times as coaches, you know, and I worked for the ultimate ball coach, Billy Donovan. Um, you know, we might want to do all the things that a ball coach has historically done. Um, but one thing that he did an awesome job was, was a psychological disposition and helping guys with that on an individual basis. So that's probably an area where I've changed too. Swing to the extreme left now. Shaka, Stephen Hawkins with the AP. Uh, since you've gone to your home state of Wisconsin to coach, it's second time in three years you've been back in Texas for an NCAA tournament. What's it like coming back? And I know you played the game here earlier this season, but coming back to Texas, what's it like for you? And is there something about it, especially being on this kind of stage where you wanted to be with the Longhorns? It's great. I mean, this is it's an awesome place. Um, Dallas is a neat place. I got to go walk down to the JFK Memorial today. I'm a big history guy. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, when the season started, I always do this. I look up the NCAA tournament sites. And so today, we could be in five places. We could be in Detroit, Boston, LA, Dallas, or we could be in Milwaukee because the season's over. And I would have taken any of those first four. Uh, so to be here in Dallas is awesome. Um, you know, you mentioned Texas. I, I do want to say Rodney's doing an awesome job. And um, I think when they went to the Elite Eight last year, uh, that was really, really special to watch and to share that with, uh, you know, other folks that had been part of that program was, was really, really cool. So it's great to be here and excited about the game tomorrow. Let's move to Zoom now. I think we have a question for Coach. Yes, we have a question from Parth. Parth, please unmute yourself and state your name, affiliation, and then ask your question. Hey, Coach Parth Upadhyay from the Daily Memphian. 
Uh, Cam Jones's kind of mental makeup, it seems like he's always just focused on kind of the here and now and has an ability to block out the noise, whether it be his comments to John Fanta about the all Big East team or, you know, he was asked a couple minutes ago about um, his NBA draft stock and, and he had no idea um, what folks were talking about. Uh, what does that say about the way he's wired and, and how does that kind of translate to his game on the court? Yeah, I'm going to have to get on Ben Steele about that rat poison that he, he tried to throw out there. Um, <laughs> I think Cam's really grown. You know, when guys come in, uh, they have certain experiences that they've had uh, in their childhood, in their high school career, in their AAU career. But to a large extent, they really have no idea what goes into being successful at this level. And I'm really thankful for his receptivity. Really, all of our guys, but you asked about Cam his receptivity to what it takes. And, you know, his competitive maturity um, has really grown to a large extent. He still has a ways to go. Um, but I think particularly the last several weeks, the last six, seven, eight weeks, um, we've seen just an increased focus in him. He's not messing around. He's here for a reason. He's here for a purpose. But at the same time, when it's time to have fun, He's definitely the life of the party. Uh, he's a guy dancing in the locker room uh, with his teammates after games. So really, really grateful to have him. Closing questions now for our Coach Smart. Next question on the uh, left in the middle on the aisle. Yeah, Shaka, Tim Kalashaw, Dallas Morning News. Um, I know your focus is Marquette right now, but with the one, two, and three seeds from the Big East all moving on, does it feel like maybe a four, five, or six somewhere should have been in the tournament? Well, I, I think so. I think that the selection process has gotten so dense with information that, you know, sometimes it, uh, the information and the data supersedes common sense. Um, now, I've never been on a selection committee Got a ton of respect for those guys. Um, those guys, including us in 2011, changed my life. So different committee now, but the last thing I would do is, was bash them. Um, I do think that when you have a team like Seton Hall that has beaten an all-time special team like UConn, and other good teams like us, you got to really, really take a hard look on, at them even beyond the numbers. I think UConn lost three games this year. So let's see, Kansas at Creighton, Kansas on the road, and, and then Seton Hall. So it's like one of these things is, is like the other. Um, so, you know, to me, uh, yes, I think a team like Seton Hall was deserving. And then it was just unfortunately an imperfect storm or a perfect storm in the wrong way for our league. We had one historically bad team that hurt everybody's numbers. We had one historically good team. Um, and then a lot of those teams that were kind of in the middle beat up on each other. Um, and so that kind of landed us where, where we are. But um, not surprised at all that we have three teams in the Sweet 16 because I, you know, put our team aside for a second. I think UConn and Creighton are, are elite teams. All right, Coach, thank you. We're out of time. Thank you for coming, and uh, good luck tomorrow. We'll see you then. Thank you. We'll see you, Coach. Media, we will uh, reconvene in the interview room in about 10 minutes at 1.50 with uh, the head coach from Duke.
that's all. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Trying to get out of the starting garage. You know what that's all.
Hey, uh, media in the workroom, we're roughly three minutes away from the start of the uh, Duke press conference, so just wanted to give you a heads up. Okay, media. Okay, media coach has arrived. Okay, we are ready to begin with the uh, Duke Blue Devils and Coach John Shire. Let's go straight to questions. Who has a first question for Coach? Be on your extreme right, Coach, by the uh, curtain. Hey, John. Steve Wiseman, Raleigh News and Observer. Uh, we saw Jalen out there practicing everything uh, early. Can you just kind of tell us how his week has gone and what you thought about the way he's recovered from that, that really scary fall? Yeah, that was uh, really 
excuse me, really scary in the moment. And uh, fortunately, Jalen got back the next morning. You always wonder the next the next day how they feel, and uh, with a fall like that. And Jalen's been great. You know, he's felt really good. Uh, we didn't do much as a team on Monday anyway, so it gave him a chance to get back. But he's been full go ever since, and he'll be ready for tomorrow night. Okay, in the back again by the curtain. John David Teal with the Richmond Times Dispatch. You mentioned last week in, in Brooklyn that Jared is different and built for moments like this. What led you to that conclusion and how did you identify those traits? Well, you know, Jared, uh, I think I, you know, I, w- I would hope you, you can see it in the recruiting process when you're evaluating a player. Uh, but you really get to know who they are when they get to campus. And look, everybody on the team, you want to play, right? Like every, every player, you want to earn minutes and play as much as you can. You want to start. And I learned very quickly with Jared, um, you know, we have in our practice, you know, white, the, the white team is the, the first group and the blue is the second group. And uh, anytime I put him in a blue jersey, he'd be talking smack. He'd be, you know, Making sure the blue, I think the blue group won every time he went to blue, and uh, by the way, when I say talking smack to me too, like he'd be running up and down, you know, talking to me after making shots and in and in uh, in a positive way when I say that, like he's just so motivated, and the stage doesn't bother him. I think that's a motivating factor for him when I've seen him play uh, at Peace Jam or the City of Palms and his, with his high school team, he's been at his best. And he just lives for those moments. And the thing that Jared did, you know, I mentioned the, you know, the putting him on blue or white. He's never given us an option. Like he just is his, since he's got to campus, he said, this is what I'm doing and I'm not going to apologize for it. And the way he's competed has been, uh, that's, that's what's so different. The maturity with how he competes uh, has been so refreshing and uh, been great to coach. A reminder to media on Zoom, if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand. Next question for Coach Shire here on your right. Connor O'Neill with Devils Illustrated. John, at the the regular season finale in the game in D.C., you were disappointed with your team's defensive intensity and effort. After last week's two games, I think both teams held on 20 points under their season average. What turned the page and what allowed the defense to click again last week? Well, it was just... uh refocusing on ourselves and you know look I I think our guys have shown throughout the year we're we're a really good good defensive team and you know sometimes when you have those a couple games that don't go your way you know our guys they don't have to uh you have to get over it quickly like so many teams that happens unfortunately and for us uh it was just getting back to the work Connor it was having each other's backs you gotta guard the ball you need a rebound and I thought uh I thought the consistency of just having five guys on the floor moving together was was the difference. And sometimes, you know, at least for us, at least, you get into February and then March, and the the practice time you have is is focused so much on other opponents. And for us, this last week and a half has been a lot on us, and uh, that's been really important. Okay, again on the right, up front. Joseph Duarte, Houston Chronicle. John, when you look at Houston's defense, what just jumps out at you in terms of how they play and uh, the personnel that they have to do what they do? Well, I, I think any time you look at a, a a really good defensive team, but for Houston, look, they, they probably, if not the best defense in the country, they, they're right there. And uh, you, you, you have to talk about their effort. You know, their effort is terrific. You know, they have uh, – they make multiple efforts protecting the basket, uh, defending in pick and roll, defending throughout the shot clock. Uh, they have really good one-on-one defenders. You know, obviously that's the best way you can break a defense down is by getting by. They make it hard on you to get by. And then when you do get by, there's going to be somebody else that's always there waiting to help. And so if you try to play uh, disconnected or not together, they're going to make you look bad. And uh, it's a great challenge. Um, they have different ways they can defend. They've uh, not just done it one way. I think since they've had some injuries and some things like that, they've also 
they've had a smaller group out there at times, and uh, they still do an amazing job. So, but I think the challenge comes down to uh, not um, allowing them to stand you up. You know, obviously they're they're very physical. They play with great uh, uh, force on that end. Uh, but you, you have to get in the paint and you have to make them, you know, help. And then you have to make the right plays from there. But, you know, they score a ton off of turnovers. You know, they do a good job turning you over and uh, making you pay for it. So it's a great challenge. And uh, you know, I'm really excited for our team to have that opportunity to go against uh, a great Houston team, but a great Houston defense. Okay, let's move to the extreme left. John Stephen Hawkins with the AP in Dallas. Kind of a historical perception on this game. You, you look, Duke's been obviously in a lot of Sweet 16s. Houston in the last five or six years is now kind of getting back to the point. What do you see now in this Houston team that's so much different than what it was for so long when they couldn't do it? They didn't do anything after Foster Lama Jamma. You know, I can't comment on Houston, you know, the last how many ever years or so, and what has or hasn't been good, but. You know, I've focused on them, who they've been this season. And obviously, this group has been together not just this year. It's been a few years in the making, right? And uh, I, I think you just have to point to their culture. You know, they just have a winning culture. You're playing a team that expects to win. Uh, Coach Sampson, the job that he's done, his staff, the program, they've developed that edge and, and that belief. That's something that I've known I've known no other way since I've been a player at Duke. You know, that's no different since I've been an assistant coach here, the head coach. We expect to win. And so both programs, you have a winning culture. You expect that. And uh, it, it makes for, I think, what can be a really high-level game. And uh, But with them, that's what I point to. I point to their culture, their belief in each other, uh, their toughness. I've been impressed with when they haven't been at their best this year, you know, just watching them on film, they still find a way to be right there in the game. And uh, that's, that's the making of a, not just a great team, but a, a, great, a great program. In the back now. Brent Zorneman, Houston Chronicle. John, being back in this state, do you have a favorite memory of the time you spent in Edinburgh? Time I spent where? Edinburgh. Edinburgh. The Vipers. Okay, all right, I got you. All right, I got you, McAllen. All right, yeah. So I just, should have said Vipers. Yeah, no, all good. No, I I remember McAllen like yours yesterday. You know, just uh, you know that was a, a big moment in my life, not just my career, going to play in Rio Grande because uh, it was right after I had an eye injury in the summer, and I got uh, cut by the Clippers in the preseason, and I had you know I played at Duke for four years. And uh, I had to go start my professional career, and that's where I went to start, uh, with Rio Grande Valley. And uh, I was fortunate to be with uh, Chris Finch, you know, who's now the head coach of the Minnesota Timberwolves. Here's my head coach. Played with, you know, some, some really good guys at the time. Uh, you know, Jarrell McNeil, Matt Janning. I can go down the list. We had a good team. You know, we played in the championship of the G League that year against, uh, um, against Iowa. I think it was with Nick Nurse, you know, and, and his team. And so for me, it was just a, you're taught a different way of playing. You know, we sent four guys to the offensive boards, shot a lot of threes. And, uh, and then obviously the town of, you know, McAllen and being down there, just, I was, uh, they love basketball. You know, it was just, it, it found my love again for the game. And uh, there was such a meaningful experience for me to get back to playing. And so to be back here is obviously in Texas. We've had some great memories at Duke here, uh, but I'll never forget those those moments playing the G League there. It was the D League then. Now it's now it's the G League. So yeah. Okay, here on the aisle, Dan Walken, USA Today. Uh, John, you know, last year you guys were a young team that got knocked out by an old team. When you reflected back on that, was that just sort of one result in your mind, or were there things about that that you take forward to say, hey, this is how we got to build Duke basketball in this era where maybe older teams are getting the upper hand in, in a lot of these tournament games? Yeah, sure. Um, it's 100% every experience that I've had as a head coach, any step of the way through Duke. Obviously, the last few years have been different with the landscape, uh, but every experience has led to action. 
you know, you have to take action from it. And for us, uh, core group from that team is back. Obviously, we added in four freshmen as well. Uh, but those experiences harden you. They, they make you tougher as long as you don't make excuses and you're really honest with what happened in the moment. And the honest truth was they were tougher than us that day. Tennessee was. And obviously, there's other games where maybe we didn't execute as well. Or you, you always learn something from those moments. But, but the tournament, it's a one and done time is precious. You know, and so for us, like that's been a reminder for us along the way. I've used it with our guys, and it's part of the development and the growth of this team. And, you know, look, I don't think we're, uh, we're not old by any stretch of the imagination, but we are, you know, we have guys who have experienced the tournament before, which I think matters. You know, Tyrese, Jeremy, Mark, and Flip, you know, those guys, well, Mark didn't play in the game you're talking about, but for us, having the experience of playing in the tournament, in addition to some of our freshmen, who is their first time, I think is very valuable. But for, for me, for our program, uh, every moment is motivation for me. Every moment is motivation for us with what we're looking to do as we move forward as well. Any other questions now for Coach? I don't think I see any hands. Coach, we'll let you go and get ready for tomorrow. All right. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks. We will see you right, then. Thank you. Okay, let's continue with the uh, Duke Blue Devils, the student athletes from Duke, Jeremy Roach, Tyrese Proctor, and Kyle Filipowski. First question for any of the three guys. I'm sure there has to be a question. Okay, here on your extreme left. Stephen Hawkins with the AP, and I'll, I'll just start with Jeremy. Just talk about when you look at this Houston team that, you know, they in the last few years have kind of been here, done that. Talk about what you see in this group this year and facing them and trying to get past them. Uh, yeah, they're a tough group. Um, obviously, they have the best defense in the country. Obviously, with a top 10, top 20 uh, offense, too. So uh, we know it's going to be a battle. Um, I think we just 
for our our mindset, we just got to come out and uh, kind of impose our will the first four minutes. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, physicality, if we match the physicality, I think uh, everything will take care of itself. So. Okay, here on the right side now by the curtain. Uh, Houston, um, excuse me, Joseph Duarte, Houston Chronicle for any of the three. Uh, when you when you look at them defensively, uh, do they remind you of anybody that maybe you played? And, and how difficult does it become when you when they don't allow you to get, you know, those looks that you, that you may normally get? Tyrese, why don't you answer that? Um, I feel like we've played teams like them all season, like the physicality aspect of it. Um, I think just playing poison and, and just limiting turnovers is going to be a huge thing for us. Um, you know, they try try muck up the game and and try and make it you know harder than it is. And I think if we just uh, disciplined and, and poised, uh, we'll be fine. Okay, let's move back again, Tom, to the left side. I'll just ask Colin Jeremy this one. Just talk about how you guys have responded um, from the regular season finale and then the, the ACC tournament, just kind of in this couple of weeks and just kind of getting back on track. Kyle, and what's been the difference? Kyle, you go first. Um, I think the most important thing is just our confidence with, within ourselves. Um, obviously, that's not the way we wanted to end the season, but uh, you know that's in the past now. We're all The only thing we're focused on is – is what lies ahead, and I think just staying within our group, um, you know, staying, staying uh, humbled, but uh, but also knowing that we gotta we gotta go out there and battle every day. Um, but doing it together is the most important thing. Yeah, I think the biggest thing was was just confidence. Um, I think just our whole like. I, I mean, I, I would just say, really, just getting that first game against uh, Vermont was a big thing for us. I mean, obviously, we knew how good we are, but uh, with the two losses and we we didn't get a win for like two two weeks, uh, you know, what I'm saying the the mo can kind of can kind of get a little a little unconfident. But I think just getting that first win against Vermont um, was a big thing, and then it's kind of just just lead us to the second round, and obviously to where we are we where we are now. But we just got to keep that confidence going, and like Kyle said, uh, at the end we got to play together. Um, can't do it all. All on one, it's got to be all 15 guys. OK, other questions? Again, on the left, toward the back. Brent Zorneman, Houston Chronicle. Houston's playing three hours from home. Does that phase y'all at all? Do you feel like with y'all's kind of following, what is your approach on that, being three hours from Houston's home? Why, don't, why doesn't Jerry, Jeremy start with that? Um, I mean, yeah, obviously, we're playing in Texas. It's basically like a home game for him. Um, but we're not. I mean, we're not worried. I mean, um, we played. We played in difficult environments all season, so uh, we're kind of used to this. Uh, but like I said, just if the 15 guys in the locker room believe and the coaching staff believe in us, then uh, we don't. We don't have to worry about whether it's home home crowd or where, where, wherever we're playing now. I mean, we know, we know it's going to be a good crowd. It's going to be a special crowd. So uh, we're ready for that environment. Okay, we have a question on now on the right in the middle. Kate Rogerson, WTVD in Durham. Um, Jeremy, you're the only starter who has played on this stage in Sweet 16. There's a few of you who still remain from the 2022 team. What have you told the younger guys, as in Flip and Tyrese, just about playing in the Sweet 16? Uh, I mean, this is. I mean, we made out the first round. Obviously, uh, it's a big thing. I think that's the hardest round. But now you got to kind of just ride a momentum um, into the second round. I think that's. I think that's the biggest thing, but obviously it gets harder as as the tournament goes on. Um, I mean, the stakes are even higher now, so I think just really it's kind of the same mentality. It's taking it one game at a time. Don't think who we can play on Sunday. Or we got to win Friday to get to Sunday. So. Okay, toward the back, by the curtain. Matt Giles, Blue Devil Country. Um, guys, the. Bench is really important now with you got three guys out for the season. So the four bench players that you do have, Ryan and Sean and TJ and uh, Jalen, can you all just talk about their importance and, you know, the history of Duke having players come off the bench in big time games in the NCAA tournament, kind of what they've, their development this year and how they've grown. Is this for all three guys? Sure. Okay, uh, Kyle, I'll let you go first. Um, yeah, I mean, just, you know, obviously this is a, a team game, and we need everyone uh, that we can get for the, for for this time of year. I mean, everyone has 
a, a specific role to this team, and, and I think we do a really good job because how selfless we are as, as people um, of just carrying those roles out, and, and that's really what's gotten us this far. So just keeping, keeping that up and, and, and knowing that each one of us is just as important as the other is, is um, a, a really big thing. Um, I think I think they've been great for us. Um, sort of coach talks about coming in in waves, and you know we obviously have our job as starters to start the game strong and and sort of set the tone, and then they have a job to come in and, and just keep attacking and keep bringing those different waves. So I think you know obviously at, at first it's a learning curve, and because everyone coming out of high school is you know the top recruits and stuff like that. But I feel like we're we're at a point where everyone knows their role and and everyone knows what to do when they're on the court. Um, just bring energy. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. Um, <clears throat> everybody's learning their roles. Um, obviously, Boog does what he does, comes in and bring defense, and him and Sean coming to bring energy, and TJ, he's coming in to shoot. So, I mean, um, I mean, everybody's kind of finding their roles and, and just deciding or really just getting comfortable with their roles and not trying to do too much outside themselves, just doing what the team asked them to do, and I think that's the biggest thing. So, um, like, you don't, you never you never know when it's, when, when it's going to be your night. I mean, uh, that's why uh, – the bench has done a great job to stand ready because obviously you've heard stories about Grayson Allen championship game, uh, getting his moment. So uh, I think just staying ready is a big thing, and I think they've been doing that all season. Okay, now let's swing to the left toward the back. Jeremy, how have you seen Coach put his stamp on this program in a, in a short amount of time in two seasons? Uh, <clears throat> I mean. He's learned, he's, I mean, he's learned from the best, obviously, but I mean, he's had a, a hell of a first season. We won the ACC. Um, people doubted us early on in the season, but I think for him, it's just really just kind of get, st keeping the group together, um, especially last year. I think that was a big thing. Um, everybody thought that I mean, we had a crazy up and down season in the beginning of the year, but then we ended up running off 15 straight and winning the ACC and then obviously ultimately falling to Tennessee in uh, round of 32. But no, I think he's done, he's done a great job. Um, obviously, this coming into this coaching job is not easy. Um, especially at Duke, so I think he's done a, a hell of a job. And I mean, we got still we still got more work to do this year, but he's done a great job this year too. Okay, anybody else? See no hands, guys. Thank you. Thank you. You're free to go. Good luck tomorrow. Thanks for coming. Good to see you guys. Uh huh. We'll see you tomorrow. Good luck. Our next press conference begins at 3.05 with the um, University of Houston. Student athletes will go first. Mr. David. You like him, did you say? Yeah. Scotty liked him too. Well, I get the impression he liked it, and I said, well, I'll have mine. We can have our sign dude look at it. We did the, you know, we hosted the Rose Bowl one time, and they had fancy ones. So the next year, we did fancy ones for one year. It was, they were pricey as all get out.
I think the Rose Bowl got a cut. We also have done that digital back backdrop, you know, you put the team's logos on. That cost a fortune too. We did it one year for a team fund. The digital background? Very.
media in the workroom. Uh, just a um, quick notice, we're about three minutes away from the start of our uh, Houston News Conference with the student athletes from Houston. We are joined now by the University of Houston student athletes. We have uh, Juwan Roberts, LJ Cryer, and Jamal Shedd for the next 15 minutes. Let's go to questions. Who wants to go first for any of the three guys for the Cougars? Okay, here on the left side on the aisle. Uh, this is for Jamal, but any of you can answer. I mean, uh, Tim Kalashaw, Dallas Morning News. Jamal, you'd seen three of your teammates foul out, and you're trying to hang on in overtime, and then you foul out. What, what was that whole – was that like a nightmare going through that game trying to survive? Um, it was a little different, a little unorthodox for sure. Um, but like we say, next man up, um, I think Ramon came in and gave us great great minutes. Damian came in and gave us great minutes, and so did Malik. So, um, And then when I fouled out, Ryan made the biggest shot of our tournament so far. So. Um, I feel like everybody came in with the right mindset, and it was unfortunate that we all fouled out, but it went the right way. You want LJ and Joanne to respond, or you good? Hey, LJ, why don't you take that? Um, I mean, it wasn't a good feeling of not being out there. We want to be out there because uh, when all three of us are out there, we feel like we have the best um, chance to win. But we had to trust our teammates. Um, I mean, it was, like I said, it was unfortunate, but we had confidence that uh, the, those guys would go out there and get it done. Next question on the aisle here on the right grouping. Skyler Dixon with the AP. 
Jamal, you've helped turn this program into a consistent Final Four contender for the first time in 40 years. You guys proved you belong in the Big 12. What's the motivation and the focus for sort of finishing the job now that you're in this position again? I don't think uh, that we changed any type of motivation or changed what we've been doing all year and for the past four years that I've been here. Um, they had a winning culture before I got here, and I, it kind of got instilled in me um, with guys, playing with guys like J1 for four years and then all the guys that were in front of us. So um, I feel like we do what we do day in and day out, every day consistently the same way, and we follow Coach Sampson, and I think that's the real reason we're here. Okay, we'll stay on the right toward the middle. Uh, Starnes Leland, the Cougar. Um, Jawan, how, how do you guys sort of deal with the emotional come down of a game like that? You know, over those following days. Um, you know, in that game, you know, I didn't want my, you know, two best players to file out, but you know, just having trust, you know, and people that's coming off the bench, and um, just doing a row, you know, um, <clears throat> Coach Sampson has a lot of trust in Malik, uh, Damian, uh, Ryan. And like Jamal said earlier, you know, just next man up. And just having that, you know, confidence, you know, and that trust in each other, you know, to just finish a game and just take every possession at a time. Media joining us on Zoom, if you have a question, please utilize the uh, raise hand feature to ask a question. I think our next one, guys, will be here on this left side, right here, uh, toward the middle. Ishmael Johnson, Dave Campbells. Uh, Jamal, you're from, you know, Maynard, um, growing town, but still small enough when you were growing up to kind of know everybody kind of knows everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, you also led them to a state final appearance as well, or state tournament appearance. What's the support been like from, from a community like that, that so close-knit, you know, you grew up with a lot of the, the football guys who were doing things in college now. What's the support been like for back home? Uh, it's been awesome. Everybody that I know from there has been supporting me um, every step of the way. And, um, when you're from a little town like that, you go back a lot. Like I've had uh, my camps there. Um, I go back a lot, go watch football games, basketball games when I can, and just go see my coaches when I can. But um, when you come from a small city like that, uh, the support is unreal. Okay, here on that aisle. <clears throat> LJ, you came from a program that has expectations of being where this one is right now. What's this ride been like from you, kind of from start to finish, and then what's it like uh, to be here now when you probably expected that when you made the move? Um, I mean, coming in, it was hard, uh, definitely, because um, both of the, the – it's two different cultures. Um, but I feel like the move was worth it, and I'm, I'm just blessed to be in the position I am today with these guys, and um, I'm excited to see how far we can take this thing. Okay, back on the left again. LJ, if I'm not mistaken, your high school career got cut short because of COVID, uh, correct, um, with the uh, state championship? No, nah, we, we lost right before the COVID. That's right, that's right. Me, so, we'll, we'll <laughs> <laughs> my bad. Uh, but regardless, that, Mor that Morton Ranch team was good, and, you know, having it cut short like that, you know, what has that been like to kind of now make up for that, you know, playing for a team that, uh, you know, of course, your last school as well, but also now playing for a team with championship expectations. And, you know, I don't know, how much does that ring in your mind of knowing how close you can get but not necessarily getting there? Um, I mean, high school never rings in my mind anymore, honestly. But um, I try to live in the moment, and uh, this is the moment we're having now. And uh, this is a special team, and we could do some special things. So, um, I mean, I just try to come in with the right mindset every single day. Um, and just pro approach things the right way. And I feel like when you do that, you're going to have success. So, yeah. I think we have a question on Zoom. Is that right, Debbie? Yes, we have a question from Greg. Greg, if you would unmute yourself, state your name and affiliation, and then proceed with your question. This is Greg Riddle with the Dallas Morning News. This question is for Jamal. Uh, I talked to your high school coach, and he said when you got the Mainer, your jump shot was one of the things you really needed to work on. And you're shooting 500 jump shots a day uh, during the summer to get ready for the season. How much has that work at Mainer helped you get to the point where you are today? Um, my high school coach was one of the first coaches who pushed me um, in ways that I didn't know how to work. Um, like, uh, 
I was one of the only guys that on our basketball team came and worked out with the football guys in the summer. And um, he's helped me prepare me for Coach Sampson. Um, nothing can really prepare you for Coach Sampson, but he, he helped me a lot on my route here. And um, he's, he's an awesome coach, an awesome person. And uh, that time at Maynard helped me become who I am today. Other questions for the three guys? Okay. We're not quite done yet. Here on the aisle, right side. So one more for Jamal. What about playing a big name like Duke? You guys are kind of a big name now. You've been a number one seat before, you're a number one seat again, but now you, you face a, a big name program in Duke. What, how do you all approach that? How do you handle that? Um, I think we prepare just like any other game. Um, they're a great, great program. They're known for great things, as they should be. They've won a lot. <clears throat> and um, they have good players today, or they wouldn't be in this position to play against us. So, um, But I think we go in and we try to prepare like we normally do um, and just play the people in front of us and not the name. OK, is that it, or any other questions? I don't see any hands. OK, guys, we'll let you go back to the locker room. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And good luck tomorrow. We'll see you then. Take care, man. Coach Sampson will join us at 320, approximately. So about six minutes from now. Okay. <laughs> Can you prepare a big sign that says that? Do that. Yes, yes, yes. Hmm? No, because we're six minutes out.
<clears throat> Who just left here? The players. <laughs> they just left. Their yeah. names up here. Okay, we are now joined by head coach Kelvin Sampson of the University of Houston. Coach, uh, you want to make an opening statement or just go straight to questions? I'll go straight to questions. Okay, who wants to go first for coach? Coach over here on uh, your right by the curtain. Coach uh, Tyler Batiste from The Athletic. Um, Hollis Price, Qantas White, guys you've known for over 20 years. How have you seen them grow? <coughs> Excuse me, have, fighting the cold. How have you seen them grow not only since then when you first met them, but as coaches over the past few years as you guys have taken this next step? Awesome question. That's, um, I'm from Louisiana, so. Yeah, I figured, <laughs> figured anywhere near the Ninth Ward? Lafayette, Corey Davis, a lot, a lot of Louisiana guys. Um, when I started recruiting, Hollis is 148 pounds, so he's grown a lot. Um, I was hoping you'd find a humor in that. Uh, but he, he was six foot, 148 pounds, uh, four year starter, never missed a practice, best practice player I've ever had, bar none. Um, Qantas, was Qantas and Hollis were high school classmates. Um, Chris, I remember them beating Chris Duhon's uh, high school team in the um, state finals their senior year. Uh, Hollis signed with us and Qantas signed with Midland Junior College. And then we recruited uh, Qantas out of Midland. But uh, Hollis was a man at 14. His maturity level was unusual for an 18-year-old. Uh, uh, he was never a kid. He was just a man. Um, he was raised by his mom and dad. I'm sorry, he was raised by his grandfather and grandmother. Um, so he lived in the Ninth Ward. You know, he had, he had, he had really, really tough. Uh, same with uh, Kiwanis. He was a Ninth Ward uh, kid. Um, but they're, they're, they're both just great human beings. Um, Hollis was a first team All-American, Wooden Award finalist. T.J. Ford, Hollis, um, David West from Xavier, Dwayne Wade from Marquette, Nick Collison from Kansas. That was the first team All-American team that year. Um, Qantas is a winner, um, tough kid. He's our starting point guard on the Final Four team. And a team that almost went back to the Final Four the following year. We lost to uh, Carmelo Anthony's uh, Syracuse team that year. Um, and now their fathers and husbands and their families are awesome. I know their their kids. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm kind of like their their old great great uncle or something. Um, but the, their their wives, their their families. I'm just really proud of them and they're. They both developed into extremely, extremely good coaches and teachers. I was just really proud of those two guys. Okay, Coach, let's go on the aisle here on the left side now. Yeah, Tim Kalashaw, Dallas Morning News. Uh, Kelvin, this will be less awesome of a question. What went through your mind when I think Garcia hit the three to send the game to overtime as you're sort of running out of players? And then following that, what do you think that winning a game like that does for your team? Well, the first thing that went through in my mind is I'm glad we didn't foul him. <clears throat> now, somebody asked me, uh, uh, should you have fouled there? Of course not. You kidding me? With 1.2 seconds to go? At what point on the catch was he not going to be in the shooting motion? Um, but um, I called timeout with 1.2 seconds to go. Um, and I knew that and it did cross my mind that Buzz is probably going to drop one of them tricky plays at his. Um, but that didn't matter because I had three guys that fouled out. We had two, two guys on the floor that would never have been on that floor in that situation. They had not gone over that enough for me to feel comfortable. So I felt, the, um, I, I felt a major, major need to call timeout and, and – uh, and just shows you what a great teacher I am, they screwed it up. You know, the big thing on switches is, is there's a gray area with the switch. You know, when a kid screens someone, that's easy to switch. 
but when he runs like he's going to switch and then keeps going, that's when the communication can get tricky. And uh, one of the last things we said is uh, whether they make contact or not, switch. Now, the no contact and go rule is called ghost. They will ghost that. So, and uh, Buzz deserves a lot of credit for that. Is uh, They ghosted the screen even though we were instructed to switch the ghost. We did not. So, when Garcia, they set the screen for Garcia, uh, they set the screen for Garcia. The guy that set the screen kept running to the corner. So Ramon and Malik kept going with that guy and Garcia, who was probably the one guy you don't mind shooting. Of course, in that situation, never going to miss, <laughs> which is why if there were six seconds to go, I would have fouled him. But at one point, too, absolutely uh, not. But, you know, we, we get asked a lot about us in that moment. Um, uh, I, I think Buzz and Texas A&M deserve a lot of credit, too. They're good. And the way they play forces you to, um, forces you to uh, have a lot of collisions. You know, say, so, well, you foul a lot. Well, they initiate the contact. There is no, you have no, you have no alternative. When they're driving at your chest, there is going to be a collision. And if you bring help, that means that you've got two people on the ball, which means somebody's free to go offensive rebound. And when you're the best at something in the country, when you're the best at something, that means you're really, really, really good. Uh, and A&M, much like Duke is right now, they were playing their best basketball at the end of the year. I think, if I'm not mistaken, they had won five consecutive games in the SEC um, and lost a heartbreaker to Florida. Uh, from, that might have been an overtime. But A&M was playing well, and Buzz is a hell of a coach. And they took it to us. Now, we were up 12 with a minute and something, three minutes to go. Um, we missed, I think, four free throws, one and once. We made one, missed one four times. Okay, you make two of those, and it's not an issue. But we did. Turned it over one time. Um, got a couple of tough uh, whistles. But... When a team comes back and the crowds get into it, uh, all eight people on the court sometimes get involved. But uh, I, my, I, ha I haven't had a chance to say this, but uh, I was really impressed with uh, the job that Buzz and A&M did. They, they, were, they were tremendous. Okay, here on the second row. Wendell Barnhouse, Learfield Sports. Um, say Wendell. Hey, um, I know that kind of one of your core philosophies is you make practices harder than the games. Mm -hmm. Big 12 this year, and nothing against the American Conference that you were in before, but how much did playing in the Big 12 for the first time and winning it, how much did that increase the toughness of this team? Well, it didn't increase the toughness of practice. Our practices never change. You know, I didn't start practicing harder or coaching better or coaching harder because we changed leagues. Um, and, and I apologize for being repetitive, but going from the American to Big 12 for us, me in particular, I was more uh, concerned about losing four starters. Jarris Walker, eighth pick, Sasser, the 25th pick, Mark transferred to Arkansas, and uh, and then we lost Reggie Cheney. Um, that was probably more talked about in our coaches' meetings um, when we started really being heavy in basketball um, end of August, September, practice started end of September, October. Um, we didn't think one we didn't think one minute about the Big Twelve. We, we I mean, it was literally not in our thought process. You know, we had an 18-year-old freshman in JoJo Tugler that we knew had to play. We had stayed away from the portal because we rolled the dice on uh, Javier Francis. We, we needed to give him a chance to succeed uh, and not have him come off the bench another year. Because in this world where it's easy to transfer, if you're not going to play him, you, you, you might as well tell him to leave because they're going to transfer. And so we didn't want to do that. We believe in our homegrown players. You know, when... When Jamal Shedd came to our program, he was 17 years old. J1 was 17. Uh, Javier was 17. JoJo was eight. JoJo was 17 when we signed him. He turned 18 May 27th. Um, and then when there's somebody else in the Emmanuel 
Sharp was 17 when he got to uh, Houston. So we, we like to take these young guys, put them through it, uh, find out what they got, uh, develop them, and then, and then they become the stewards of our culture. You know, um, coach, uh, uh, player-led teams are far better than coach-led teams. And this team is very much a player-led team. Um, you know, Jamal gets a lot of the credit, as he should, but, but Jaywan doesn't get near enough credit. You know, Jaywan's also a leader. He's not as loud with his voice uh, as um, Jamal is, but, but Jaywan is so sincere. Um, and, and his emotion, his, his emotion is um, um, captured in a different way. You know what, Reg, Reggie Cheney was, Fabian White was a great leader for our post guys, and uh, Bryson Gresham was. But they've le learned from, you know, seniors leave, next group comes, seniors leave, next group comes. You know, I've been there 10 years, so we've had a lot of really good groups. But the leader of this group of post guys is uh, definitely uh, J1. And um, JoJo and Javier, their day will come too. Um, but I, I, can't, I can't tell you how pleased I am with the buy-in, uh, the accountability that our kids have for each other. We have about four minutes left in this time frame on Coach's right toward the middle. Uh, Starnes, Starnes Leland, the Cougar. Um, Damian Dunn has seemed to be playing with more confidence since the postseason started. How big has that been to see that uh, in March? Yeah, m much needed too, Starnes. Um, when we lost uh, Terrence, you know, we had to change channels. Then when we lost JoJo, uh, both of those to season ending surgeries, I mean, those were two key pieces for us. Uh, you know, we just kept, you know, those were two huge hits. And then when Ramon uh, had the lateral, lateral meniscus um, uh, injury, you know, those three guys made us a good rebounding team. Your rebounding doesn't come from one guy, it comes from a collective effort. Um, uh, Damien, though, um, you know, it's kind of been up and down all year, uh, probably down more than up, uh, to be honest. Um, but he's, he, you know, I, I watch him in practice every day, and um, I, I just can see it there. It's, it's a matter of, it's a matter of uh, bringing it to the court, and I and I give a lot of credit to his teammates. They've they've kept believing in him. Uh, sometimes you need your teammates to believe in you when maybe you don't believe in yourself enough. Um, so Damien, Damien has awesome teammates that, that help him along the way. You know, it's, he got 17 in the first uh, tournament game against Longwood. I don't remember what he got against uh, A&M. But uh, just his body language on the court has been better, and I think that's reflective of his confidence. Okay, closing questions now for Coach Sampson in the back on the left. Chancellor Johnson, KPRC in Houston. Uh, even with all the injuries and, uh, and, and your rotational changes, one guy who's been steady for you throughout it seems like it's been LJ Cryer. What is his, uh, what is his game? Uh, what what's stood out about his game over the past month or so? Just getting better. Um, I, I don't know why you have practice every day if you're not trying to get better. You know. Don't, don't buy into that adage that once you get to February, you are what you are. That's not true. Um, L, L, LJ has, has been on a constant battle this year to become more than just a shooter. You know, we run a lot of sets for him where he has to come off pin downs. And uh, not to shoot it, you know, if they're locking and chasing, that means they're chasing him into the paint. So once he turns, turns the corner off a of screen and gets downhill into the paint, what's your game, son? You know, don't 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 show up at the party and you don't have anything to offer. You got to have something. Uh, so he's developed his float game. Uh, he's developed a runner. Um, he's getting fouled a little bit more. Uh, we put him in more and more pick and rolls um, in the in the three areas: uh, side, slot, middle. Uh, he's learned to read uh, the game uh, down the middle and to in front and behind him. Uh, just developing. I mean, that's that to me is what um, a, a coach's job is. You know, just don't recruit the best players and hope you can win. That very rarely works out. 
But recruit kids that are really good, then develop them. Because once you develop them, that means they own their skill set. Because if they're not developed, that means they're renting it. And if they're renting it, that means somebody gave it to you. And it's a lot better to own it. Um, LJ owns his game right now. He's really worked hard and developed it. But I have to give a lot of credit to Qantas White. Qantas is an awesome teacher, man. He's, he's, you look at the kids that's come through this program. Uh, Damian Dotson, NBA draft choice. Quentin Grimes, NBA draft choice. Uh, Marcus Sasser. Marcus Sasser, Jerry, Jerry West, shooting uh, top shooting guard in the nation last year. Uh, Qantas White was the guy that is his position coach. And now is LJ and Jamal. You know, we just keep getting really, really big guards that are, be, that are being drafted NBA or getting national awards. And I don't think Qantas White gets enough credit for that. Okay, we are out of time. Coach Sampson, thank you very much for being okay, with us today. Thanks, guys. And I uh, wish you good luck tomorrow. We'll see thank you then. You. Thanks, Coach. I'm going to leave your name up there. No. I don't think anybody wants it. <laughs> no, I'm leaving it. <laughs>